Welcome to our study, friend. Uh, we are delighted to see you. I have taught you from many different uh, studies, as you know, and <clears throat> this is a study of nature. Uh, we want to get back to the simple things of life. We want to get back to God. And so in studying these 50 things that God says about sex, uh, we are hoping to, to bring all of us to a place uh, to respect what God has said, to respect His law, to obey His law, and to be a happy people. It's very essential to my way of thinking for us to be happy in this life and in the life to come. I urge you to let God help you and to bless you. In today's lesson, it's, <laughs> it's very close to all of us. There's hardly a family of any size in America what does not have a divorce related somewhere in that family. And we, we, must, we must see what God says about it. And many of us are, are feeling that we can do as we please, that we have a right to do as we please. Uh, we do not. We do not. Uh, we are the servants of God, and God has the rights, and we are His servants. We must live for Him. In these lessons, we begin with the sex drive, lesson one, and then why is God so protective about sex, uh, number two. In this first lesson, we show you there are many drives, human drives within us, and this is one of them. And God is protective about sex because of the immortality of the soul. Not that he wishes to rob us of any joys or any pleasures that we should have, but because of the immortal aspect that sex creates immortal creatures that can never die. Our last lesson was that of the X-rated marriages. Uh, it's showing you that you should not marry with, with the wrong people and uh, with sinful people, uh, and, and that God specifically relates it through the entire Bible. And I hope that you were able to see that, uh, that very special talk. And today's lesson, uh, sex and divorce. May we read from the words of the Master. He had something to say about it. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 9, the Lord Jesus said, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now, uh, uh, so many people want you to interpret what the Bible says. I really don't believe in interpretations. The Bible says exactly what it means. So why don't you just accept it for what it means? And, 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 and uh, I say, listen, Lord, I, I understand English and I see what it means. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. So why don't we accept them? Sex is very closely related <coughs> to the divorce problem, as you will know. Early in human history, the human desired more than one woman and, uh, and got outside the bands if God wanted Adam to have two, he'd have made two Eves. He only made one. And so he set the pattern right there. In Isaiah 4 and 1, it says, In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man. Our saying, We will eat our own bread, we will wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name and take away our reproach. Uh, to take away our reproach means to give them, a, give them a child. A woman feels that she's under reproach if she cannot bear a child. And so, says, uh, we will pay our own bills. <laughs> we are working people. We will pay our own bills. We make good money. All we want you to do is to take away our reproach, that people know that we have been married and that we can bear a child. And you say, when is that? Uh, in Isaiah, it's talking about the time of the Great Tribulation. We're getting close to that period of time when there'll be people that'll say, just give me a baby, please. I don't need to be married. Just give me a baby, and uh, you won't, I, won't be any, I won't be any problem to you. You don't have to support me or anything. I, all I want is you to take away my approach. Church leaders, uh, the Bible taught us very explicitly, were to be the husbands of one, of one, of one wife, and that, that's <laughs> very imperative. Uh, in our uh, world that we live in today, we have monogamy, when there's one to one, uh, that's one man and one woman. We have polygamy, uh, which is one man and more than one woman. We have polandry, which is one woman joined to more uh, than one man. And, uh, and uh, that is in certain parts of the world. And then we have today's uh, situation where people uh, simply live together in what we call common law uh, without marrying. And we also have in many countries of the world what you call concubinage. Uh, in the, I've lived in a hundred nations of the world, and uh, in most other countries, uh, they, they have the, the man that makes a little money. He goes and gets himself another woman, sets up another house over there, and he has what he calls his concubine. And uh, this cohabitation uh, without a legal marriage 
is done in all places in the world. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 23, there was a man that did it right in the beginning. You see only four chapters in the Bible. And Lamech said unto his wives, he'd already had more than one, uh, Ada and, and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man in my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. He had gotten into a great problem, a great problem. He doesn't identify the problem here. It maybe had to do with more than one wife. It had to do with somebody wanting to take one of his wives. It had to do with a problem there. And he says, the, the, I, I live under the judgment of God because of the things that I have done. And non-Christian religions, uh, like, for example, Mohammedism and the Koran, um, a man is permitted to have four women, four, four wives. And uh, he can divorce his wife very easily by just saying, I divorce thee. And, and so, uh, uh, but when we come to the world of truth and the world of God and the world of, 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 uh, of, of spiritual reality, uh, then the Lord Jesus had direct words to speak about that. And he spoke those words in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32. He said, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her, that is divorce, committed adultery. Now those are the direct words of our Lord and our Savior. That's exactly what he meant, and he'd like for all of us to, to, to understand them and to live by them. Uh, divorce uh, is admitted and uh, it's admitted uh, on a basis of human uh, failure. Uh, two humans have failed, or you don't have a divorce. Uh, and so, uh, and what we don't realize many times is that when the divorce comes, that it's not just the two people that are harmed, their children, their whole families, and it, the total society is harmed. Uh, when a divorce comes about, everybody's hurt. Uh, did you know that uh, almost 40% or, or more of all the money that's used to, to, to assist people uh, by our government and, and assisting the, those that are helpless is, uh, is aid to divorce people, uh, divorce women and their children. Uh, just look, if we held our homes together, uh, we could be a, a rich nation. You know, in just two or three ways we could be a rich nation. If everybody stopped drinking alcohol, did you know that we spend more money for alcohol than we do for all the food that we eat? If everybody just stopped smoking cigarettes, now those two things don't mean anything to you. They're not life. They're death. Uh, the, the nicotine causes cancers of all kinds. Alcohol causes over half the deaths on the road, uh, uh, automobile deaths. It causes most of the divorces. It, it, always alcohol-related. And so there are only two problems, but they would bring tremendous uh, financial help to the country. Just think, if we had all the money that, that's spent in, the, in alcohol to buy food with, well, food would be cheap immediately because we would double the capacity for food uh, right now. And then all the money that we waste on other things. We could bring prosperity to this country just by living the right uh, kind of a life. God help this country uh, to do uh, just that. And so when two persons fail, a man and a woman, uh, they influence the total society, but especially themselves and their children. Many people never get over them. Uh, it's, a, it's a break and it's a hurt. Uh, uh, psychologists tell us that a divorce is the second greatest trauma that can come to a human being. The, the, the first is, is the death of a parent can, can, uh, can, can really upset the, the emotional situation inside of a person. And the second is, is a divorce where you cut asunder two that God has put together and that uh, it can bring all kinds of strange reactions into people's life. Divorce is the result of not discovering God's grace to unite two lives. That's all it is. When you have a divorce, you have a problem that's arisen that people can't handle. They haven't prayed together. They haven't read the Bible together. They haven't loved together properly. And therefore, they have to run from one another. And so, it's a breakdown. It's where two people failed in the greatest issues of life. God directs a whole nation uh, regarding divorce because God is interested in us as a nation. When God was forging together a new nation that you call today the, the, the nation of Israel, making them a political entity, uh, he gave specific sex laws to that nation. And in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, uh, God told you this is the way it is, that when a man had taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, that's happened, 
because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a, a bill of divorcement and give it to her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go into another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement given to her hand and send her out of the house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife. So God began to do, give specific rules for, uh, for, uh, uh, for having a marriage and for having a family life. If you marry a woman and after you married her, you found out that she's a harlot, that she's not a clean person, then God says, you don't have to live with that uncleanness. Give her a bill of divorcement and let her go. And that's the only reason that God gives so. In the book of Malachi, chapter 2 and verse 16, that's the last, that's the last book in the Old Testament. God says in Math Malachi 2 and 16, he says, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. <laughs> now, God is not pleased when, when two lives that are promised to, to live together and two lives that are promised to walk life's pathway together, sever themselves one from another, God says, I hate that thing. And if God hates it, I wouldn't be involved in it if I were you. I'd find a way of rectifying this situation. Divorce has to do with about two essential things. One is selfishness. Uh, one says, I don't get what I'm supposed to have. I don't get the love I'm supposed to get. I don't get the attention I'm supposed to have. I don't get, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. And so, uh, Divorce has a very strong relationship to selfishness. Somebody is not sharing life properly together. And so it has to do with selfishness. And then divorce uh, has to do uh, with, the, with the breaking up on the inside of, of a moral, of a moral thing that God has bound together and, and a spiritual thing that God has bound together. And if we break these strands that God has put together and they fall apart, then we go marching away from one another uh, to another kind of a life. And many times that becomes an unhappy life also. Uh, that's God's feelings about divorce. He says, I hate it. If God hates it, if I were you, I'd stay away from it also. And uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 9, here's what God says. He says, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life. <laughs> that's what God said. He said, live joyfully. You're not supposed to get dull and, and, and angry and all upset in your older days. He says, live joyfully uh, with the wife that thou lovest all the days of thy life. It says, for that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor, which thou takest under the sun. That's thy portion. To live joyfully with thy wife uh, whom thou lovest all the days of thy life. So we are commanded uh, not to live just part-time with a person. We live full-time, full-time, our whole and our total lives. In the society that you and I are growing up in today, there are millions of people that are living together as common law. And uh, when you meet God, the, the, the whole thing finishes on, on what we call the mission fields uh, where we have labored. As soon as people that are living in common law find Christ, they always get married. Never have we ever found it. Never. I've, I have performed weddings with five and six children around me that are sitting there watching their mother and father get married. They, they, they had lived in, a, in, a, in, a, in an adultery and, and that God had not brought them together. And, and so when, they, when Christ came into their heart, nobody had to tell them to. Nobody had to say, you got to do this. Something inside said, we're not doing what's right. And we know we shouldn't do it. And so now we're going to make it right. And I have performed the weddings personally. And I've been to many others personally too. Sometimes having five or six weddings at the same time, uniting together people that have been living together in common law. When, when, when we come to a confrontation with God, we know what is right related to sex. It's only away from God that we seem to have our problems saying, well, we don't know what's right. You do know what's right when you know God and you know the Word of God, which is the Bible. The, the, the uh, very uh, wise man Solomon in Proverbs 5 and 18 said these words, Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. We are not to go halfway through life and, and trade. <laughs> he says rejoice with the wife of thy youth. The Bible uh, speaks to us very, 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 very specifically 
on, uh, on, 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 on some situations. And in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 13, it gives us one of those. It says, If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasion of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman when I came unto her. I found her not a maid, that she wasn't a clean person. Uh, then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the, of the damsel's virginity. And unto the elders of the city and the gate, and the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and now he hates her. And lo, he hath given occasion of speech against her, saying, I found the daughter not to be a maid, not, not to be a, a virgin. And yet, uh, these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him, and they shall immerse him a, a, a hundred shekels of silver, take them away from him, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel. And she shall be his wife, and he may not put her away all his days. <laughs> uh, they refused him that. Uh, and uh, there are people like that. You know, you, you get married together, and it looks like everything's going to be all right, and you start accusing one another of something. But they had laws in Israel. We don't have them today. Uh, where if you came upon a problem like that, you had to stick with it. And that the parents could, could come and say, wait a minute, we intervene in this situation. Here are the proofs of the virginity of my daughter. And, and so, therefore, uh, do something about it. He has to pay a levy to the father for the embarrassment, and he has to live with the lady according to the laws of the land the rest of his life. Now, there are many of you that simply did not know that that law was in the Bible. You didn't know it. And, and <clears throat> God said a lot about sex because God wants us to live together. We live in, in a country today where in some counties in our country, we have a few more uh, divorces than they have weddings each week or each month. If they have 200 weddings, they have 225 divorces in that same county. Thank the Lord there are not many counties like that. But we're coming to a place in America where the home is not stable and, and the people are, 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 are not stable. And for any little excuse, growling and, and grumbling and, and fussing with one another, they run off to the divorce courts. And, and the divorce court lawyers are, are becoming exceedingly wealthy, just charging hundreds and hundreds of dollars to get you away from your companion. Uh, they don't get you away, you get yourself away. Uh, they only perform the, uh, the, the, uh, the legal part of it, and you have to pay for it very dearly. And then the judges uh, make decisions that have no relationship to God, no relationship to the Bible. A judge told me in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to my face, he said, there are times in the court when you must realize, Mr. Summerall, that the court is God. And I looked at that attorney and I said, sir, I want to tell you something. The court is never God. And you better believe it. And you better believe it. God is God and he is sovereign and he is above all human beings. He is above all courts. Courts rise and fall. Democracies rise and fall. Nations rise and fall, empires rise and fall, and God remains the same. And so we must realize that. We're not living by the law book of the land. We're living by the law book of God, which includes the law book of the land. You can obey the laws of the land very easy when you obey the laws of God. And I urge you to reconsider your life. I urge you to love God. I urge you to have a forgiving spirit. If, if your wife or your husband has hurt you, I urge you to reconsider the thing and say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, if we'd have a spirit of forgiveness, well, we could, uh, we could uh, eliminate 99% of all of your divorces. But when we have a, an obdurate mind and we refuse to forgive and, and we for refuse to forget, we keep dragging stuff up out of the cellar, we keep dragging stuff up out of the muck and accusing one another of things, then we're going to have broken homes and broken hearts. Divorce is so selfish. It destroys little children. They sometimes never get adjusted as long as they live. They have to go and live with some in-laws 
and some stepfathers and stepmothers. They, they're never in the right place. They, they never have what they should have in life, the comfort of a father and a mother. And every child needs a mom and a dad. They need the caresses of a mom, and they need the spankings of a dad. They need them both in a home. In order to have courage and strength, in order to have love and compassion, you need them to stand them side by side and walk with them. Uh, it is never perfect for one person to rear a family, whether it's a male or a female, it makes no difference. God made it in such a way that it takes two walking together to have a beautiful home. We want your home to be beautiful. We want Jesus to bless you. And we hope that if you are having a problem in your home, number one, you'll go to the Bible and read what the Bible says about it. And then you'll go to prayer and let the Spirit of the Lord come upon you and the power of the Lord come to you and forgiveness come into your heart and let the God of peace bring tranquility into your heart. And then you will ask the other one, sometimes we stop talking to one another. We'll stand right up and say, please forgive me, I'm wrong. You say, but I'm not wrong. Well, that doesn't matter whether you're wrong or not. Just say, I am wrong, I am sorry, forgive me. And whatever the other says is all right because it takes two to make a break. And then when you, when you forgive and, and you help and you love and you bless one another, God can do the rest. And prayer does it a lot too. You can pray for your loved one, you can pray for your mate, and God can change their way of thinking. God can change their way of living, and God can change things. Let's go more to God than ever before. Let's go more to the Bible than ever before. Let's find the place of bringing national happiness. If you had a war, and you had no homes, you had no faithful men, how are you going to hold a nation together? What have they got to fight for? They don't, they don't have anything to fight for. Who's going to fight for a tavern? Who's going to fight for a bottle of liquor? Who's going to fight for a harlot? Nobody, nobody. You only fight uh, for home where you've got loved ones that you depend on, that you trust, and, and that you care for. Uh, you'll, you'll die for it. Our homes are so important. Love your home, please. Love your own wife, please. Love your own husband. Stepping out and thinking nobody's going to know it is one of the biggest deceptions you've ever known. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. There's nobody too clever. Nobody. God has a way. Oh, when I look back through my life and see the people that thought they were clever and stepping out on their partner and, and by a telephone call, by a casual look by somebody when they were out, somewhere, somewhere down the line, the thing became known because the Bible says your sins will find you out. There's no hiding our sins. God will reveal them. And uh, you may think your neighbor did it or a friend did it, uh, but honestly, God did it. They might have been the instrument that God used, but God did it. So if I can encourage you, don't go the way of divorce. Love your wife. Love your husband. Love your children. Love your in-laws. Love your wife's people and your husband's people. Sometimes a woman just gets against the, the husband's family, and, and they're, they're, they're not perfect, but neither your side perfect. And, and look at the thing honestly and truly and forgivingly and live together in great joy all the days of your life. The happiest place in the world is a happy home. No place is so happy. And the place that God can plant his blessings is a happy home. May God bless the homes of America. May God bless your home. May I minister to you right now with prayer, please. Father, bless my friend right now. And Lord, cure any illness in this home. Cure any misunderstanding in this home. Let the healing of God come and heal the home, heal the breaches. And Lord, if they've stopped talking, get them talking again in love. And if they've stopped loving, get them to loving again. Let the Spirit of the Lord come and bless my neighbor. I believe you for this miracle. Lord, the divorce, the divorce wrote, the divorce rate is climbing in this country every month. Stop it, we pray. Put an end to it. Turn America around to go the other way. It's God's way. It's the best way. It's the good way. Now, Lord, I believe you to do it, and I thank you for doing it in Jesus' name. Be blessed. <laughs> be blessed. And I want you to be blessed in Jesus' name.